Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Tom Rafferty. Thanks very much, Byron. Thanks, everyone. Uh, my name, as Byron said, is Tom Raftery. Uh, I'm talking on the Internet of Things and Energy. Um, we're going for a bit of a record today because um, this talk is a 45-minute talk with 100 slides, and I'm going to have to try and get it done in 18 minutes, according to Byron. So go. <laughs> the talk structure is in three parts. The first part is I will talk a little bit about IoT, what IoT, the Internet of Things, what it is. Uh, then I'm going to give you some bad news, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. But we're going to finish it off with some good news to lighten the mood at the end of the day. So, IoT. IoT is basically an evolution of what was known as machine to machine. It's machines communicating with each other. And we've had this for quite a while. But what's happened now is the sensors have become cheaper and it's come down into everyday household items. Things like uh, Philips light bulbs, uh, drop cam cameras, smoke detectors, thermostats, etc., etc. Um, I've got a Philips light bulb set up at home. I can uh, use my, my telephone to contact it while I'm here. I could pull out my phone now and turn the lights on and off while I'm here. It's not just that, though. It, clothing has now become uh, connected as well. Uh, I have a Fitbit watch myself, which is connected. It's not, an, it's not an Apple watch, but it's a Fitbit watch. It sends data about my heartbeat. It sends data about the amount of steps I take up to the cloud. So now everything is starting to become connected. It is what we're terming the Internet of Things, or as Cisco likes to call it, the Internet of Everything. And Cisco are uh, extrapolating out the, the, the numbers and saying we're going to have about 50 billion devices or things connected to the Internet by the year 2020. And if you think about it, that's pretty incredible. That's seven items per person on the planet by 2020 connected to the Internet. So what? Well, we'll come back to that. Now for the bad news. The Earth. Uh, you may know it as that blue thing Bruce Willis is always trying to save. <laughs> or from its famous collaboration with wind and fire. <laughs> or just simply as that place where George Clooney lives. Anyway, the Earth had some genuinely bad news this week. A White House report that says global warming threatens every part of the US. This isn't something in the distant future. Climate change is already affecting us now. Now, smart move, Obama, that is a key shift in how to talk about climate change, because we've all proven that we cannot be trusted with the future tense. <laughs> we've been repeatedly asked, don't you want to leave a better Earth for your grandchildren? And we've all collectively responded, eh, fuck them. <laughs> but, incredibly, this latest damning scientific report may still face an uphill climb with some of us. There's that Gallup poll that came out last month which found one in four Americans is skeptical of all the effects of climate change and thinks this issue's been exaggerated. Who gives a shit? That doesn't matter. You don't need people's opinions on a fact. You, you might as well have a poll asking which number is bigger, 15 or 5? <laughs> or do owls exist? <laughs> or are there hats? <laughs> the, the debate on climate change should not be whether or not it's, it exists. It's what we should do about it. There is a... It's what we should do about it. And that's what we're going to talk about. But just a couple of quick backgrounders on that. This is the um, Keeling curve, it's called. It is the amount, the amount of CO2 measured in a place called Mono Laua in Hawaii, above the thermal uh, inversion layer. Uh, it went above 400 parts per million for the first time in the history of the planet on the 9th of May, 2013. It's cyclical, it goes up and down every year, as you can see in the curve there. But, and that curve is from 1958 on the left to 2015 on the right. So first time, uh, 2000, 9th of May 2013, it went above 400 parts per million. Uh, last year, 2014, it went above 400 parts per million and stayed above it for three months. This year, 2015, it went above 400 parts per million and stayed above it for six months. In a couple of years' time, it's going to go above 400 parts per million and never come below 400 parts per million again in our lives. That's scary. It's scary because if you look at this chart, this is a chart of the colored lines. The colored lines there are the hottest six years in the history of the planet. And the black line on top, that's this year. 
which is causing things like glaciers to retreat, floods that are killing people in Pakistan, or sorry, heat waves in Pakistan, floods in India, a drought in California, and wildfires all across the US, et cetera, et cetera. We're all familiar with these headlines. There are three important numbers I want you to take away from this presentation today. 2565 and 2795. What are they? Two is two degrees centigrade. It's the amount that we've said we want to limit climate change to. 167 countries signed the accord in 2009 saying we were going to limit climate change to two degrees C. 565, what's that? That's the amount of gigatons of CO2 we have to push up into the atmosphere to get to two degrees C. It is our carbon budget. What's a gigaton? A gigaton is one billion tons. So if you think of one ton, approximate, think of, a, think of a ton of lead, for example, so you can get kind of a picture of what a ton is, or your car in around a ton. Now we'll talk, now think of a billion tons. Now think 565 billion tons. That's the amount of CO2 we have to push up into the air. So, so, so now, now it sounds like a lot. Unfortunately, we're pushing about 50 tons a year, 50 gigatons a year up into the air. Now 25 of that comes back down. It's sucked back down by natural processes. So the net increase is about 25 gigatons year on year. The last number, 2795, what's that? Unfortunately, that's the amount of proven reserves that the fossil fuel companies and countries have. Proven reserves means this is the number they have their uh, lendings based on, their share prices based on, their value of these companies is based on them getting that 2,795 gigatons out of the ground and into the upper atmosphere. And if they don't do that, they lose 80% of the value. And that'll cost the global economy two, uh, 22 trillion US dollars. So we have a choice now, 22 trillion dollars or a livable planet. It's, it's a tough one, I'll leave that with you for a while. So after that battering over the head of the bad news, we get onto the good news portion. The good news is that the emissions that are causing this problem come from, in large part, electricity generation and transportation. So electricity accounts for 38% and transportation 32%. So together with electricity and transportation, we've covered 70% of emissions. That's a pretty interesting lever that we've got right there. Because if you look at transportation, it's becoming, as we've seen, electrified. And it's not just the cars. We've got, this is the electric double-decker bus, which is starting uh, on the London fleet next month. They're buying 300 of these BYD buses. Uh, they're a Chinese bus. Uh, they take four hours to charge. They charge overnight, and the charge goes, the charge is good for a full day. Uh, BMW are producing trucks. Uh, electric trucks, electric 18-wheelers. For now, they're using them for their own logistics, but I expect in time they'll start, using them as a, they'll start producing them as a product. Uh, the Dutch rail network is run entirely on electricity. It's not the only one that is, but it, it is run entirely on electricity. What's interesting is it's currently at 50% from renewables, and their plan is by 2018 to go to 100% from renewables. Uh, we've seen ships that are being powered by, um, by, by solar, Obviously, the early ships were all powered by renewables, typically wind. Uh, we've seen planes. Uh, this is the solar impulse plane, which is at the moment stuck in Hawaii for, with battery problems. It was doing a circumnavigation of the globe. And this is the Airbus E-Fan. The E-Fan flew for the, it's, it's, at the moment it's a prototype, but they flew the prototype across the English Channel. Uh, it took them 36 minutes earlier this summer. And in 2017, they're bringing it into production and they'll be producing two-seater and four-seater versions of this. So that's transportation. It is starting to be electrified. It has a long journey to go, but we'll get there. Electricity generation. Uh, we've had some good news on that front too, because the, this is from the US, this data is from the US. Uh, every April is when you get the peak of emissions in the US from electricity generation. And this April, we had the lowest emissions from electricity generation of the last 27 years. So emissions from electricity generation are going down. Unfortunately, that's due to the fact that they're burning gas rather than coal instead of moving to renewables, but we'll get there. Now, if you think of telecoms for a second, 
This is, uh, this is Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone. Uh, this is him with his first phone in 1876. And if you put him in front of one of these iPhone 6s today and he looked at it, if he figured out it was a phone, I think you'd be patting him on the back and saying, well done. However, this is Thomas Edison, the guy who's credited with architecting the first uh, energy grid. And if you put him in front of any of today's energy grids, he'd recognize them straight away because they've hardly changed a jot in the last 100 years due to enormous underinvestment. But that's starting to change. Electricity grids today are dumb. If you get an outage on an electrical grid, the first the electricity company hears about it is when someone picks up the phone and says, we have an outage. And the first question that the operator will, will ask them is, OK, what's your address? And how they localize where the problem is, is from the phone calls they get in and they write down the addresses and they go, OK, well, we have several out in this area. So they send out a truck, and the first truck roll is to, is to find out if they can find the problem. And then they call back and they go, yes, we got the problem. It's a tree down. And then they send out the second truck roll, which is the vegetation unit, to cut up the tree and fix the problem. It's bonkers. Electricity is buggy, it's read-only generally, it, they provision for hits. What I mean by that is they build power plants called peaker plants, which only uh, come on for two, three months, two, sorry, two, three weeks of the year. Maybe the Christmas time when there's uh, all the Christmas lights are on and everyone's turning on their heat, or in hotter climates in August when everyone's turning on their air con. These plants cost millions to build and they're only used, as I say, two to three weeks a year. It's bonkers stuff. And then you've got renewable energy, which many utilities view as kind of a boogeyman. And I can understand why, because this is a curve of demand. The top blue one there is a curve of demand. It's a daily demand curve for electricity. The, the bottom curves are the weak. So you can see the pattern holds throughout. So it's a predictable curve. Whereas this is the curve on the same day of the wind generation. You can see it's out of sync with the demand, and it's typically that way. Uh, wind typically blows more strongly overnight when less people want electricity. So it's problematic for utilities to build it into the grid. This is a, 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 a situation they had in Denmark earlier this summer. It was uh, 11 p.m. on, well, it was 10.44 p.m. on a Sunday evening, and you had 140% of the country's demand for electricity being produced by wind. There were still other generation sources in the system, but 140% from winds. So they, they had to export it and sell it to their neighbors. So this causes all kinds of problems. And one of the ways you fix that is with storage. And you can have exotic storage solutions like compressed air, compressed uh, underground air, or pumped hydro, like in this diagram. Or you can start to get things like this. This is a grid scale battery. This is a two megawatt battery produced by a company called Alevo, but they're not alone in that. Lots of companies are producing batteries like this. And as we heard this morning, the battery technology is getting better and better and cheaper and cheaper. So this is going to start to become a real um, solution. As are the power wall that we've seen up here that Tesla are producing and uh, the, the likes of vehicle to grid storage. Storage itself, uh, we, we've seen the, the really interesting things that are happening there. Uh, things like uh, forgetful scientists accidentally quadruple lithium-ion battery lifespan. That was a story that was, uh, that was out a couple of weeks ago about some scientists who left something in an oven for too long and decided to try it anyway. And suddenly they found they'd quadrupled the lithium-ion battery lifespan. So we're getting breakthroughs like this all the time. Not necessarily forgetful scientists all the time, but there you go. Uh, new aluminum air battery and Samsung have a battery that they say could last a lifetime, so the, 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 the amount of uh, cycles it can go through is almost infinite. So we're getting breakthroughs all the time. And then we have things like the Tesla Gigafactory. This, and they, they call it Gigafactory 1 because they're saying they're going to build more of them. This Gigafactory is going to produce about 35 gigawatt hours of storage every year starting in around 2020. And the reason, it's, the reason it's impressive is because the global production of storage in 2013 was about 30 gigawatt hours. And this is going to produce 35. So it's more than doubling the global production of storage in this one plant. And the, the, the really interesting thing about that is, as well, the, the plant, as you can see there, it's, it's covered in solar panels, and it's surrounded by wind farms. It's totally renewably powered. And the, 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 the uh, economies of scale that come from that kind of production of batteries, they say, will, produ will reduce the price of batteries by about 30% 
which is enormous. And it's necessary for Tesla as well for producing the cars they want to produce. So the energy storage business is growing fast. Solar, solar is really interesting because this is a graph called the Swanson Curve. And it, I know you can't see it, it, it I'm afraid. The, the problem is the axis is too high. Uh, but the axis is high because the, the vertical axis is the price per watt of solar power. The horizontal axis is years. So that goes from 77 to 2013, and you can see the price is you know, cratering for solar. And basically, the, the Swanson effect says that for every doubling of solar output, the price drops 20%. So the Swanson effect is Moore's law for solar. And you can see the, the outcome of that is uh, the orange on this graph here is uh, the, the, same, the same as before. It's the price drop. The blue is the solar output. It's the amount of solar installed. So as the price is dropping from left to right, the amount of storage installed is just going up and up and up. So as, and then you get a virtuous circle because as the, as the price drops, more people buy it more output, price drops, more people buy it. It's a beautiful circle. You've seen uh, there was a record low price in Dubai uh, for, for solar of 5.84 cents per kilowatt hour. Now, by itself, that means nothing to you probably, but 5.84 cents per kilowatt hour is massively impressive when you think that 99% of the electricity in Dubai is generated from burning gas, and that costs nine cents per kilowatt hour. So in Dubai, they're now getting solar for about 60% of the price of their electricity generation. And China has said that they are going to install 70 gigawatts of solar power in the next two years. A gigawatt, if, if you want some kind of context around it, a gigawatt is a nuclear power plant. They're going to install 70 nuclear power plants worth of solar in the next two years. That would be impossible with nuclear. It takes five to seven years to build a single, nu single nuclear power plant. India have said they're going to install 100 gigawatts of solar between now and 2022. So it's, solar is taking off, and as it takes off, the price will just keep coming down and down and down and down. And then you get to a situation where you wonder when the price gets lower and lower and lower, what, and this is a thought experiment, what are we going to do when energy is in abundance? Who? is going to create the Uber for electricity. Because it's going to happen. And this is where IoT comes into it. Because it can help a lot. Because I, I mentioned machine to machine at the start. And you, we have all these big companies out there on the high voltage, that's the HV fee there, the high voltage side of the grid. They've been doing this machine to machine stuff for years and years, particularly for things like the wind turbine assets that are out in the field. They need to be in constant contact with them, sucking in their data. The medium voltage side of things, similarly, not as much, but now they're starting to digitize that side of it as well. Because I was talking to Schneider Electric about this, and they said it now costs them about a dollar to put a system on a chip on any of their substations or any of their transformers, so they're doing it on all of them. And why wouldn't they when it's only a dollar? And then you get to the low voltage side of things. And that's where things start to get interesting for us because that's the kind of consumer side of things. And we talked about this already. You've got the smoke alarms, you've got the drop cams, you've got the nests, all these things are now connected. So now suddenly we have connectivity from the edge right into the home. You have applications like this. This is a, this is a smart utility systems application which allows you to control all the devices in your house. And now, because everything is connected and can talk to each other, you can start to turn electricity consumption into a market. You can start to uh, play with the pricing because this is a graph of three days pricing of electricity. And you can see from it that the electricity pricing on the wholesale market can change by more than an order of magnitude within, within a single day. And this is pricing that we're not exposed to. So we don't do anything about it. But we could, if we knew about it. And if this was digitized and, and sent out across the system, and if our machines were listening for that information and responding to it, it's called demand response. So on the left, the chart on the left is typical demand. Chart in the middle, the dotted line is how the demand is affected if you introduce solar into the system. 
chart on the right is typical demand, and the dotted line is how the demand is affected if you introduce efficiency into the system. Demand response, though, is where you actually tweak it so that you increase demand when demand is low, and you reduce demand when demand is high. So you're leveling the demand. And the reason this is, this is useful is because once you start to level that demand, then the instability that's introduced into the system by the renewables, by the wind coming on at nighttime, by the solar coming on during the day or dipping when the clouds come, once you start to uh, match the demand to the supply, you make the system far more stable. And the more stable the system is, the easier it is to introduce more renewables onto the grid. Also, if you're, if you're selecting far cheaper electricity, and this is very counterintuitive, if you're selecting, actively selecting for cheaper electricity, you're actively selecting for greener electricity. Because as the price drops in the wholesale market, the fossil fuel generators drop out of the market. But the renewables in the market are price takers. They will stay in the market no matter what the price. They'll just say, keep giving me money, I'll keep giving you electricity as long as I can produce it. So as the price drops, the percentage of renewables is increasing as the fossil fuel guys drop out of the market. So the Electric Power Research Institute came up with an automated demand response, an open demand response, a protocol earlier this year, and it's been introduced into the market. Uh, it's called the Open ADR Alliance, who, who, who are pushing it out there. It is a protocol for machines to talk to each other using Internet of Things technologies. It's an open standard. It was generated with uh, utilities. It was generated with uh, academic institutions, uh, and it was generated by, the, by EPRI themselves all, to, all together. So this standard is out there now, and it will allow devices to listen to pricing and adjust their behavior because there are many loads in your home which can do that. You're not going to change when you eat, obviously, but you may change when your dishwasher comes on or when your dryer comes on and have those devices themselves listen for the signal and adjust their behavior. This is a Whirlpool device which is smart grid enabled. It listens for signals and it adjusts. If you put on your uh, clothes washer at night, you don't care when the clothes are washed, as long as they're washed when you get up in the morning, or the same with a dryer, or the same with a dishwasher. The same with an immersion for heating your water in your home. If you have an electric immersion, if it's lagged, if it's properly insulated, you don't care, as long as when you get up in the morning, you have lovely hot water. It can happen anytime. Same with the fridges. Storage solutions. This is, this is an interesting one. Almost there. This is an interesting one, because Tesla have said they're going to try and sell 500,000 cars a year in 2020. That's their aim, 500,000 cars a year by 2020. Now, they may have, let's, let's say they have an average, let's say they drop the, the battery size, and let's say they have an average 50 kilowatt hour battery. And let's say they get halfway there, let's say they sell 250,000 cars. So 250,000 times 50 kilowatts is 12 and a half gigawatts, that's 12 nuclear power plants a year. Tesla can become a virtual power plant by buying and selling energy from the battery, with the buy-in of the Tesla owners, obviously. But suddenly, you're starting to do energy arbitrage from your car. Even Eric Schmidt in Google, and Google are looking at this actively as well, but Eric Schmidt has said, I could imagine a smart garage where I would plug in my car and the computer handles it. I could even make money by cost shifting. It solves energy security, energy prices, and job creation, and by the way, climate change. It doesn't solve climate change, but it helps. There's massive disruption ahead, as we've heard several times this morning. It's not, th this, is, this is one of my favorite cartoons out of The New Yorker, because the guy is talking about all the things that's, that, all, all the advantages of working on this, and then the other guy in the background said, what if, it's, what if it's all for nothing? But of course, it's not all for nothing, because two things, final two things. Citibank released a report uh, several weeks ago saying that the cost of inaction on climate change is $192 trillion. $192 trillion if we do nothing. The cost of action on climate change is 190. It's cheaper 
It's cheaper to act on climate change than to not. Also, key benefit of renewables, better health for everybody. So, in conclusion, electricity has an emissions problem. IoT can help. There are massive opportunities ahead for everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Brian.